Okay, this video is um, the Western Abdomen. This is chapter two from the book, Medical Reformation and Vegan Renaissance Bible by me. Um, we're going to talk about the abdomen in Western patients. Okay, um, when I say Western Abdomen, I mean by that everything you could see on a CAT scan of the abdomen. I've seen, I don't know. 30,000 more than that abdomen CAT scans, all right? I've seen so many of them, you know, it's sort of like... Um, all right, rule number one of intelligent diagnosis is that most patients have the same disease. And that's actually a profound statement because in medical school, students are taught in residency also, internal medicine and everything, about all these different diseases as if they were all separate independent entities. And the, the reality is when you start to really study disease and causation for a couple of decades and try to really understand it, you see that most of it's all the same thing. Okay, so here's like a typical American middle-aged man. He has a big fat belly and he says, oh, I've got a beer belly. But no, he's really got like an estrogen belly, okay? He's estrogen overloaded. It's a fat storage hormone, you know, tells the body of a pregnant woman to, you know, gain weight, store the weight. Uh, the baby might need that for energy. And there's, you know, estrogenic chemicals in his processed food and his beer. He's got a little bit of mild uh, breasts, you know, man boobs called moobs. And they're not just fat. They're also gynecomastia, I mean, breast development. You can see that on a CAT scan, uh, often breast development in these fat men. So what I'm saying is he thinks he's macho with a beer belly and actually he's stupid and he looks like a pregnant female. Okay. Uh, fatness feminizes men. Uh, they'll have more of the aromatase enzyme in their adipose fat tissue that converts uh, testosterone into estrogen. And the same obesity is associated with hypertension and hyperlipidemia and atherosclerosis, plugging up the arteries to the Johnson. And then they also start tending to read more romantic novels. Okay, just a joke. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. And they start preferring to watch soap operas. Okay, um... There were some funny quotes of Voltaire. He said, Systems of metaphysics are for, for philosophers what novels are for women. And Voltaire says, Doctors are men who prescribe medicine of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less for human beings of whom they know nothing. <laughs> okay, yeah. So basically, like I said, too, you know, fat, middle-aged, American, Westerner, you immediately think, okay, the guy's pre-diabetic or diabetic. He's hypertensive. He's uh, probably, you know, very often impotent. More than half of them are impotent by 50 years of age. Uh, they say in general you can go by the same percentage as a decade, 40% in their 40s, 50% in their 50s, 60% um, in their 60s. And it's probably more than that from what I've seen. I can remember being shocked by some of these young doctors asking me to, for, for you know, advice on um, Viagra when they were in their 30s and 40s. I'm like, holy crap, you guys fix your diet. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, when you, you look at the uterus, um, it causes proliferation of the uterine cells, the estrogenic chemicals. And so it's very often when you look at a CAT scan of a middle-aged and older woman that you'll see fibroid tumors in the, in, they're benign tumors in the uterus, but they can lead to infertility, they can lead to discomfort, painful periods and all that, and they're a common reason for women to go on to get a hysterectomy. But women have a big advantage in a sense for menstruating in the sense that every month they get a therapeutic phlebotomy and that lowers their hematocrit, lowers their the amount of red blood cells in their blood and that makes their blood less thick so that they um, have lower blood pressures and that high blood pressure is the number one risk factor for atherosclerosis in the arteries of the heart, the brain, the Johnson and whatnot. So by having lower, uh, better blood pressures, they're less prone to getting atherosclerosis. Plus, because they're bleeding every month, that means they have to replenish those blood cells coming out of the bone marrow. And when red blood cells first come out of the bone marrow, typically they live about three months, 120 days. They're more deformable. The red blood cell is typically about seven microns in diameter. A capillary is only about five microns. So to pass through the capillary, the red blood cell has to deform itself to get through there. And what I'm saying is the younger red blood cells have a more flexible outer membrane, plasma membrane. Over time, it gets glycated, like you've heard of hemoglobin A1C glycation 
by sugars of the red blood cell plasma membrane. But in addition, there's something called phosphatidylserine externalization. That's a phospholipid that moves from the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane of the red blood cell to the outer leaflet. And that happens progressively over the aging of the red blood cell. So what I'm saying is a woman menstruating, thus having more young red blood cells coming out of her bone marrow to replenish those lost by menstruation, she has a younger average age of her red blood cell, meaning that they're more deformable, more flexible, thus it requires less blood pressure to push them through the circuit, okay? Blood pressure is dependent on the harder spot to get blood to is the top of your brain because you have to push against gravity. So your blood pressure is going to be whatever it takes your heart to get that blood to your the top of your, your brain, all right? So if you've got more flexible red blood cells, you can push them through the capillaries easier, blood pressure comes down. If you've got less red blood cells, blood pressure will come down. Okay, so... As a matter of fact, whenever I see a demented female, like, you know, less than 60 years of age, I, I look real quick for the usual stuff. Is she an alcoholic? Is she a drug addict? You know, did she have major head trauma? Does she have some weird autoimmune disease, lupus, limbic encephalitis, or something like that? Does she have chemo brain or something? But is she deficient in vitamin B12? Those are all common causes, not relatively common causes of treatable uh, dementia. But I can tell you, if it isn't one of those things, I go right to the surgical note. And it's pretty common. I'll see that she had a hysterectomy at a young age, before the age of 35, almost always for fibroids. And uh, so she stopped menstruating, and thus her physiology becomes more like a guy. And, you know, the guy, he's already seen all his friends. You know, so-and-so is, is impotent, so-and-so had a heart attack. Um, and so he starts thinking about those risks, you know, in his 40s, if not sooner. Whereas a lot of times the woman's oblivious. You know, her premenopausal friends don't have these problems. Uh, so they don't realize it, and they've got developed severe hypertension and start having all these strokes and stuff. Also, though, you know, Westerners, they're kind of promiscuous. They have a lot of complications of sexually transmitted diseases, a lot of infertility. Um, they can get things like tubal ovarian abscesses. So I think women are much more at risk for these things than they realize. Plus, also, a woman could be asymptomatic with a sexually transmitted disease, and she could fibros off her uh, fallopian tubes and end up infertile, have increased risk of ectopic in pregnancies, or just plain old infertility, be unable to have a baby. Um, and I think there's a diminished respect for being a housewife and a mother. And that's a, traditionally always been what women did. And I can tell you it brought a lot of joy to them. My mom had to have uh, C-sections for all the her kids and they told her she can't have any more kids uh, because they're afraid her uterus was going to rupture and she was real sad about that. Uh, so, I mean, don't get me wrong, she still had a bunch of kids, but she wanted more. Um, it was average for, like, in the Victorian age, in the 1800s, for women to have, you know, like, 10 children. Okay, so nowadays, what's the average American woman have? One kid? It used to be 1.5. Now it's probably one. I don't know, but I'll bet you it's about one. And what I've seen is it's going to keep on, you know, staying around that lower, go lower. Okay, and also these women with the big families, they're real happy. Uh, what I've seen of them back in the old days, they were married, they seldom was divorced. Okay, let's get it. Nowadays, oh, what do I see? My friends in ob my friends who are friends with ob sexually transmitted diseases off the charts. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, genital warts, herpes, unwanted pregnancies, elective abortions, infertility. I see lots of women who've had more abortions than kids <laughs> uh, when, I, when I read the charts and stuff. Um, infertility, end up childless, lonely, okay. Um, okay, now we're going to talk about abdominal pressure syndrome. Um, I see this all day long, every day. Um, so when you have fiber, fiber pulls water into the stool, and so it makes it softer. So a normal bowel movement for a human should be like a cow patty most of the time, whereas a constipated processed food eater who eats lots of meat and oils they don't have any fiber. There's no fiber in meat. There's no fiber in, in oil. Oil is just liquid fat. Um, the only animal food, uh, actually, there's no, there's no fiber in animal foods. Okay, so the point is, this tends to lead to constipation because the stool's dried out. You're, they're pooping goat pellets or Tootsie Rolls, and they're often straining a little bit at stool at defecation. That's called the Valsalva maneuver. Okay, so this chronic straining causes increased uh, intra-abdominal pressure. And the back pressure on the sigmoid colon, which is the distal part of the colon, causes the wall to, to have these little bulges, outpouchings between the muscular layers. And that's called diverticulosis. Um, eventually, one of these will sometimes pop, 
and that's called diverticulitis. Itis means like inflammation. So it'll pop in a little bit of stool. Feces will leak onto the adjacent mesenteric fat, and it'll cause quite a bit of inflammation, be very painful. And if it's just a small perf and it gets wild off fast, you can treat them with antibiotics. Very common, a couple of patients get admitted every week into Western hospitals for diverticulitis. Again, if it's mild, you can treat it with antibiotics, but a lot of times it's more than that. You get a big abscess there, we can treat that with a catheter uh, drainage, you know, cascan guided catheter drainage. I've done over a thousand of those. Um, sometimes they have to go for surgical drainage, and sometimes they, they have to go in there and they take out part of the sigmoid colon, often with a temporary diverting colostomy, so it's no fun. And so the best way to avoid this, eat your plant foods, get your fiber, okay? Um, the increased abdominal pressure causes a lot of other problems. It'll cause the stomach to bulge up into the chest. That's called a hiatal hernia, HH. Um, then you get gastroesophageal reflux in there with the acid, stomach acid, and that'll cause a change in the uh, lining the epithelium of the esophagus at this level, and that's called a Barrett's esophagus. GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease, and that can be treated like with antiacids, proton pump inhibitors, which you really don't want. They can increase your risk of becoming demented. Um, and the esophageal cancers change. It used to be when I was a young guy, smoker drinker cancer, squamous cell carcinoma is a, the histological subtype. Now it's uh, a lot more common. It's adenocarcinoma. Okay, um, other things related to that. The chronic increase of abdominal pressure pushes down on the rectum and it can cause distension of the rectal veins. Distended veins are called hemorrhoids. Those can bleed, a little blood on the, the tissue paper there chronically. Um, back pressure going down into the scrotum and that'll cause a varicocele, which means dilated vein in the scrotum that can heat up the testicles and cause infertility. So like I said, constipation can cause male infertility. Um, the back pressure going down into the leg, to the lower extremity, that can cause varicose veins. So a lot of times women are interested in that. You seem like you know what you're talking about. You tell them that. The stool, because it's dried out on the right side, normally the stool on the right side of the colon should be liquefied. Okay, But when you eat this uh, lack of fiber diet, you will get formation of little stones, stool balls. And they can be called fecaliths. You know, lith means stone, so feca means feces, fecalith or we'll call them appendical lift. The appendix is a gland, you know, imagine it being about twice as long as a pinky finger that extends out of the bottom of the right side of the colon, the cecum. Okay, and it's got mucus glands in it. So when you block its connection to the cecum, the mucus glands just to that continue to secrete mucus and they can cause it to become distended, painful, and it'll pop. And again, you're leaking stool then into the, the abdomen, to the <clears throat> mesenteric fat, the fat of the abdomen, the visceral fat, the deep fat, not the subcutaneous external fat. Then you have a fascial layer, your muscles, and you have your intra-abdominal cavity, your peritoneal cavity. It's got mesenteric fat in it. Anyways, it'll leak stool in there, and then that'll initially just cause inflammation, but if bigger amounts get out, it'll start to cause an abscess. An abscess means you've got enhancing walls that are quite inflamed in central pus, and the relevance being that the antibiotics can never get to the center of an abscess fluid collection, so you typically will have to drain those with transcatheter techniques. That's what I used to do a ton of when I was an imaging guided surgeon, primarily interventional radiologist, versus now, um, if it's worse, then you have to do an open surgical procedure to drain them. I've had patients with appendicitis where I've had to drain seven different abdominal abscesses on them. Okay, um, and the same diet also causes increased incidence of gallstones, you know, high fat diets. Gallstones, 95% of them are cholesterol gallstones, so high cholesterol is associated with precipitation of the cholesterol in the bile, in the gallbladder, and getting gallstones, okay? So this is pretty typical stuff. Also, the increased abdominal pressure causes more inguinal hernias down in the groin area. Actually, I didn't draw it on here. It would be too complicated, but periumbilical hernias uh, around the umbilicus and the anterior abdominal wall, that's common. Dennis Burkett, he is an Irish surgeon who was a Christian missionary to Africa, and he figured out the... Uh, pattern of a disease called lymphoma in the face that got named Burkitt's lymphoma, the subtype of lymphoma. And he got put in charge of all the epidemiology of Africa in around the mid-1900s. And he noticed there was a different pattern of disease. The plant-eating populations, um, like especially in the native African populations, they didn't get any of this, uh, these typical Western diseases. He had operated on tons of these when he was back in England where he did some of his residency and work. And um, but he didn't see these amongst the people eating plant-based diets. 
And so basically, Burkitt came up with this concept of abdominal pressure syndrome. Okay, um, so it's good to know you can avoid all this stuff. Plant foods always have fiber because the cell wall of a plant is made out of fiber. And animal food never has it because the cell wall of an animal is made more sturdy, more rigid by cholesterol. So the animal food always has cholesterol. The plant food virtually never has cholesterol, but it always has fiber. So that's typical that plants have all the good stuff. They've got the fiber, they've got the potassium, they've got the magnesium, they've got the nitrates, precursors of nitric oxide, and they've also got the, um, the antioxidants, you know, what you want. And <laughs> what does the animal food got? It's got a lot of saturated fat. It's got, um, you know, a lot of iron. It activates mTOR, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we talked about these things here. Oh, I recently talked to a radiologist who's from Iran, and he said to me, all of these American patients have diverticulosis. I'm like, well, no shit, everybody knows that. Anybody who reads abdominal CAT scans, they know that you see diverticulosis all day long every day. You'd expect most of your patients that are middle-aged in America to have diverticulosis. And so I said, yeah, everybody knows that. And he says, well, he said, and I'm thinking, you know, kind of like, why would you even say that to me? That's so obvious, all right? That's like saying the sky is blue. And then this Iranian doctor, he says to me, he goes, it's not like that in Iran. He says, in Iran, we don't have diverticulosis. The patients, you almost never see it. People eat lots of fiber. <laughs> you know, sort of like the wheat, the wheat basket part of the world or something there. Okay. All right. Um, the, oh, the acid blockers can cause other problems. They'll cause um, decrease because you need the stomach acid to help convert uh, nitric. When you eat the nitrates from your plant foods, the greens, on the back of your tongue, they get converted to nitrites. So they go from nitrates NO3 to being NO2s, nitrites, and they go in the stomach and the gastric acid helps convert them to nitric oxide. There's just NO, nitrogen, oxygen. Okay. And so this idea of the, the PPIs, proton pump inhibitor drugs being used to treat the gastric acid, but then they cause secondary problems. Because they deplete the acid, they can cause the problem, like I said, with getting your vasodilator from your nitric oxides, okay? Uh, they can cause problems also with digesting your food. You get more bacteria. You can get bacterial overgrowth in your small bowel. That's called SIBO, small intestinal, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and that can cause problems and uh, discomfort, etc. Um, and, and like I said, that's how taking the drug causes a side effect. Then you take another drug, like antibiotics for the SIBO, a new side effect. It can cause dementia, etc., etc. Okay. Um, the thing that happens with the fiber and the good bacteria is they, they convert them into short-chain fatty acids. The short-chain fatty acids right here, SCFA is how they're often abbreviated, uh, the most important one is the four carbon butyrate. Okay, you just think of alkane in organic chemistries like butane. When you make it into carboxylic acid, call it butyrate. All right. So the butyrate is used by the intestinal lining cells to make tight junctions. I'll talk about that more in an upcoming slide. Um, and also, what I'm saying here too is the fiber comes through your gut, doesn't cause any problems, gets converted to short chain fatty acids. Those are absorbed including a two-carbon acetate and a three-carbon propionate, uh, plus, of course, the four-carbon butyrate. That also helps maintain the blood-brain barrier of your brain. It protects your brain in addition to protecting your gut. And the, and the liver can take those two-carbon and three-carbon short-chain fat, fatty acids and just make them into more fats. So what I'm trying to say is forget about good fats. You can't be too low in fat, okay? I'm, I've given previous lectures on that subject. There have been studies where you feed a patient less than 1% of their calories from fat. Just feed them omega-6s, and they degrade. And I realize omega-3s are an essential fat, too, but the amount you need is so small that it's a non-issue. You eat plant foods, you're going to get all your good fats. You can just forget about worrying about it. The goal is really to minimize fat, minimize protein. And then you can also ask yourself, how could that be true? Easy. Just look at what your ancestors probably ate, a bunch of plant foods, which naturally puts them in the ballpark at 80-10-10, 80% carbohydrate, 10% protein, 10% fat, approximately, and really even potentially lower than that in the fat and the protein. But 
ballpark 80 10 10 is a reasonable <laughs> estimate of what's pretty normal to have happen um, Westerners eating chronic high fat diets they tend to accumulate fat in their liver that's called fatty liver and the medical word is like steatosis and you'll often hear you know NASH non-alcoholic steatohepatitis when it starts becoming a little more inflamed and that can lead to cirrhosis that's actually the most common cause of leading to cirrhosis end-stage fibrosis of the liver liver failure and going on to a liver transplant um, after the fat is accumulated in the liver that causes uh, worsening diabetes you can no longer manage your blood glucose during the fasting phase and you'll tend to be hyperglycemic around the clock you also, once you filled up your liver with fat, you start accumulating more and more fat in the pancreas. That's called fatty pancreas. And if you ask, ask any old-time radiologist, they'll tell you they see fatty atrophy of the pancreas all the time. A lot of them won't know. Most of them won't know that that's fatty atrophy of the pancreas causing type 2 diabetes. Okay? But fatty liver, you see it all day long. And you see fatty liver routinely for other indications. Like let's say a patient comes in for kidney stones. So you're doing a CAT scan or an ultrasound for kidney stones. You routinely see a fat li fatty liver most of the time. And for the same reason, a high meat processed food diet is associated with more kidney stones. So the same patient, it's associated with fatty liver. Usually you'll see the bottom of the heart on a CAT scan. And you'll see that uh, like the left anterior descending coronary artery right here is calcified. It's got atherosclerosis calcifications. You know, when you see the abdominal aorta in the back here too, you see that that's all calcified too. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, I hear all this crap about, oh, I don't want a protein deficiency and become sarcopenic, or oh, I need my good fats, and I'm like, what a bunch of nonsense. All day long, every single patient I see, I will expect to see these things. Fatty liver. No, don't be wrong. There'll be a few that don't have it or don't have all of these things, but most of them have a bunch of them. Calcified coronary arteries, screwed up, advanced atherosclerosis of their coronaries, fatty liver, very often they got gallstones, fatty atrophic diabetic pancreas, um, and diverticulosis. I mean, you can expect to see that. Very often hiatal hernias. Okay, um, this is just a typical Western abdomen. The main job of the liver is to make sure that the brain always has uh, glucose, adequate amounts of glucose in the blood. Okay, the main job of the lungs is to make sure the brain has adequate glucose, adequate oxygen, and the main job of the heart is to, to pump blood to the brain. The brain is sort of like the most important thing in our bodies. Um, let's see. So when the when the blood glucose is high all the time because the liver can no longer regulate blood glucose levels during the fasting phase. I mean, it has to know how much glycogen to break down to release glucose in the blood, how much gluconeogenesis to run. It's, it's, it's the expert. It's Johnny on the spot for taking care of that. And when it becomes fat accumulated, it doesn't function correctly. Okay. All right, so this is just more of the stuff you see all the time. Very commonly, the main thing I see in the abdominal aorta is just atherosclerosis. You know, the walls are kind of sclerotic and they're calcified. Um, we often see a little bit of ectasia, mild dilatation of the abdominal aorta. You know, it normally should be less than two centimeters in diameter. I'll call ectasia two to three centimeters in diameter. We call it an aneurysm, you know, a triple A abdominal aortic aneurysm when it's over three centimeters. Usually they take them to the operating room, like for a stent graft, when they get to over five centimeters. But, you know, the best thing to do is. Don't have a problem at all. <laughs> Eat what you're supposed to, and you'll probably never have a problem with it. Okay, very often we'll see kidney stones. Kidney stones are increased by, especially by, you know, eating sort of a meat-based diet. We talked about that because it's a high acid load. Amino acid is called an acid because it's a load of acid on the body. And in addition, you know, the buffering systems lead to more excretion of calcium. Um, so that will predispose to kidney stones. So you get a stone up here in the collecting system, like let's say in a calyx, not a big deal. Usually those we call those non-obstructive stones. But when they become dislodged, as they sometimes do, they can obstruct, let's say, the proximal ureter right here, or more often in the distal ureter. And then this will get back pressure, and it can cause uh, kidney failure. The spine gets degeneration of the discs, primarily due to ischemia. Um, the F- in the water also will damage the collagen and predisposes to uh, degeneration of the spine, as does my impression based on the reading of Stephanie Seneff and, you know, just understanding it. It also appears that GP glyphosate that's sprayed on a lot of processed food, like soy, for example, which is a cheap protein for processed food, um, it also appears to probably be damaging to the collagen. 
Collagen's like one third of the protein in your body, okay? And it's the it's sort of the the lattice, the scaffold upon which our body is built. And so when that gets degenerated, that will also be damaging to the spine. And you'll get narrowing of the disc, that's called degenerative disc disease, and then the spine will develop a curvature. So scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis, you're typically talking about, you know, in a person 50 years of age and older, getting an induced curvature of the spine due to degeneration of the disc. That's totally different than scoliosis, adolescent scoliosis of the thoracic spine. That's like the girl in junior high who wears a brace, okay? No, I'm talking about older people getting progressive degeneration of their disc. And if you degenerate it more severely on one side than the other, that will induce a curvature in the lumbar spine. And I see that all the time. It's so common that mild degenerative scoliosis, a lot of times I don't even mention it, okay? Um... And then we talked about this other stuff. Oh, one other point I want to make about the spine while I'm showing this is that these things progress in a stepwise fashion. When you get degeneration of the disc at one level, that puts more stress on the, the disc above it. Um, it's called a, a spinal segment, the vertebral body above and below and the intervening disc. And so to be, have an abnormal disc at one level can induce segmental instability. The spine has a lot of proprio receptors because its job is to protect the central nervous system. So when it sends abnormal motion, it starts laying down calcification and tries to fuse those vertebral bodies. Bridging osteophytes on the side or the front of the disc is called DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. I see that all day long, every day. Um, when you get calcifications across the disc space, that's an interbody fusion. When you get calcifications on the posterior part of the disc and along the posterior longitudinal ligament, that's also called OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. You can also calcify, ossify the ligament in the back. That's much less common, though. That's ligamentum flavum. So that's OLF, O -L -F, ossification of ligamentum flavum. What I'm trying to say, though, is I see these things all day long, every day, on tons of patients. And, um, you know, it's all the same thing. This is the Western abdomen. And so people say, oh, all these different diseases. Well, to me, it's all the same thing. You know, kind of, you're acidic, you're forming stones, you're atherosclerotic, and you're hypertensive, so you get the triple A. You're hyperlipidemic with all the fat, you get the fatty liver. So it's all the same thing. It's all dietary-related diseases. And it's all preventable. There's a lot of patients who don't have, you don't have to get these things. Oh, here's just a little more detail of what I was referring to on the spine. So this is DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. So just hyper bone formation in the skeleton. Interbody fusion when you fuse across the disc space. Um, this was the DISH, the bridging osteophytes anterior or on the sides. And this is what OPLL is, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, which just means calcification, ossification of disc bulge related to degenerative disc disease. Degenerated disc disease means the disc is ischemic, lacking blood supply, so it starts to fail, it starts to crack. When it cracks, it dries out. The central liquid part, the nucleus pulposus, dries out. The disc loses height. Sometimes the nucleus pulposus also herniates through the cracks. The outer part of the disc is a round circular thing like a steel belted radial tire. It's called the annulus fibrosis. And normally the disc is alive. It runs on anaerobic glycolysis. So it does need that glucose from the blood. And, you know, walking or something gets the muscles going and it kind of milks in by diffusion osmosis the glucose. And, and likewise, it extrudes its waste products to be cleared away into the venous system and the lymphatic system. So things that you're supposed to do, they make it better. Walking, eating the low-fat, low-sodium vegan diet, improving blood flow. Um, otherwise, you end up with this, you know, with a fused spine. And it fuses all the way from the pelvis area, the sacrum, all the way up to the skull. So it's a cranial sacral fusion of your spine. And a person like that becomes very stiff, and they get progressively weaker. And a lot of times, they end up walking on a walker. And all it takes is one fall, and they can get really bad fractures of their spine. Instead of being flexible, like a normal, healthy person, they put their hands out, they fall down, they're a little embarrassed, they get up, life goes on. These old patients, when they fall, they'll sometimes fracture their spines and they'll snap like a piece of chalk. That's called a chalk stick fracture associated with DISH and they become paraplegic from that. I see one of those every couple of months. Um, so this, And so my other joke is it reminds me like of the Chronicles of Narnia 
Remember the story where all the people were being turned into stone by the wicked queen or like the Greek mythology of uh, Medusa? And that's what happens. These patients are like turning into stone. <laughs> and I, I literally mean it. Their aorta and the other blood vessels are becoming extensively calcified by their atherosclerosis. Their spine is becoming fused all over the place and stiff. And then it becomes weak and they're in pain, so they, they become even more sedentary. And so they're ossifying, they're fusing, they're, they're rusting, they're a mess, okay? And, you know, this is preventable stuff. And they might only have one or two of these in their 40s, and then, you know, five, six, seven levels in their 50s, and then by the time they're in their 60s and 70s, they're all stiff, okay? So you don't want this to happen. And like I said, it doesn't have to happen. You know what to do to prevent it. Maintain good blood supply to your spine. Low-fat, low-sodium, vegan diet. It's not rocket science. Avoid GP in your, uh, by avoiding processed foods. Avoid... Uh, Avoid uh, F minus by filtering your water or moving to a place where you got well water that doesn't have that in there. Um, and then the same thing, like I said, that's happening to this aorta, it's happening to the brains of their, the arteries of their brain, and that's why they become so stupid, okay? Not to be mean, but any doctor, you know, when doctors talk to themselves privately, like I said, they'll tell me every single one of their patients over 60 is cognitively slow. And, you know, healthy people don't need to, I'm 60, okay? <laughs> but, you know, I don't have any medical problems because I'm a low-fat vegan, all right? And that's what you want. Whereas in the hospital, you see these patients over 60, they're very polite, but they're kind of like cow-like. Yes, thank you. And they seem to like have almost no insight. You know, they're like, please help me, you know? And you're like, well, you got to help yourself. You do what you can to try to help the patient, but unless they fix a diet, the underlying cause of their atherosclerosis, they're not going to get better, Okay. Okay, so oh, this is sort of the comment that Western men over 55 tend to have a stiff spine and a soft Johnson. And it's all because they eat the wrong diet. You know, Esselstyn was real bright. He says, I look at the epidemiology and he says, in all the plant-based eating countries, they don't have atherosclerosis, whereas in all the meat-eating countries and the high-fat diet countries, they got a lot of atherosclerosis. So don't eat the things that cause atherosclerosis and you won't get atherosclerosis. I mean, that's pretty simple. And that's the correct way to think. And also, you know, Esselstyn's kind of like an Old Testament, you know, prophet guy, okay? Thou shalt not eat oil, okay? Thou shalt not eat these high fat foods. He's right, avoid the nuts, the avocados and all that stuff. And you'll get your, um, you'll get your, your lipids down and you'll be less prone to atherosclerosis. Hyperlipidemia is atherogenic because the LDL cholesterol sticks the red blood cells together. It's a bridging molecule, um, meaning that it sticks red blood cells together, thus it makes the blood thicker, increases blood viscosity. Thick blood requires higher pressure to pump. You know, you're pumping a milkshake with thick blood, high fat meals, unlike pumping water with a normal vegan diet, so the blood pressure has to go up to get that blood up to the top of the brain. High blood pressure starts injuring the arteries at branch points, at bifurcations, because it hits the median divider really hard, then it splashes off of there with a lot of turbulent flow and retrograde eddy currents, and that predisposes to atherosclerosis formation because the endothelium senses that as an injury and it starts to shed its non-thrombotic glycocalyx and express prothrombotic molecules like more accessible VCAM, vascular cell adhesion molecule, for example. I'm going to go through all this in the atherosclerosis chapters, but I'm, I'm, what I'm, the, the point I wanted to make was all of these things go together. And I've also talked about it before. The good way to think is, is uh, holistically. And I remember that joke from the movie. The movie was called Colors, okay? And the joke was told about the two bulls up on a hill. So there's two bulls up on a hill. And the young bull says to the old bull, Hey, hey, look at all those cows down there. Why don't we go down? Why don't we run down there and screw one of those cows? And then the old bull says, Let's walk down there and screw all of them. Okay? And so the point of it is that when you fix your diet, and that's a species-specific diet for humans, you then don't just fix one problem. You can fix a whole bunch of problems. You'll get thinner. Blood pressure will improve. Diet, blood sugar levels will improve. Atherosclerosis will start to be prevented. Okay, All kinds of good things happen. Your skin will get better perfusion. You'll, have, you'll look younger, more of a glow of vitality. Okay, That's one of the things you notice when you look at old sick people. Their skin is kind of pale, like it's not getting much blood supply. They look like they're half dead. Um, versus you see people who, you know, tend to eat healthy and stay healthy, they still got that glow of vitality, you know, emanating from them, that energy, and it's attractive. Okay, um, you know, the average 60-year-old Western man's a cardiac rehab patient, okay? 
and they tend to think it's genetic. You know, like typical patient, I'll talk to them and they'll go, oh, well, you know, it's got to be genetic because everybody in my family has it. I'm like, everybody in your family has it because you all eat the same diet. All right. Um, kidneys will often form stones right here in the junction of the renal pelvis and the ureter that's called the UPJ, ureteral pelvic junction. Um, most commonly, they get lodged right here in the distal ureter. I'll sometimes see stones in the urinary bladder, sometimes see a bladder cancer there. I routinely have patients who've got a big prostate and then they'll have urinary retention. They can't fully empty their bladder. They've got a large post void residual. Prostate is the male equivalent of a female uterus, meaning that it's sensitive to estrogenic hormones. So that'll cause prostate enlargement. So that's another reason for a guy, if you don't want your prostate to get big, you want to avoid all this estrogenic stuff, meaning you want to avoid the meat, you want to get your fiber, so you because that lowers your estrogen levels. I'll talk about that. I got plenty of information in this book about estrogen stuff but those things will help you to not have a progressively enlarging prostate so you won't have so much urinary retention you won't have to wake up so much at night to avoid okay and I see tons of patients with small kidney stones and so what you want to do is stop making them okay you stop making them you probably never have a symptomatic kidney stone but if you keep on going on with the same bad habits you know lots of the meat and stuff you know, caffeine makes them worse too, you will increase your risk of having more kidney stones. It can be very painful. You don't want that. And that's what I'm saying. Patients tend to have multiple abnormalities. It's pretty routine to look at an abdominal CAT scan on a Western patient. You're going to see some small kidney stones. You're going to see some gallstones. You're going to see diverticulosis. Um, if you talk to them, you'll often find out they've got other problems. So you're going to see a fatty liver. You're going to see a hiatal hernia. Okay, and the same patients have much increased risk of uh, cancer, of course. It all be all these things go together. Okay, here's what we're talking about. By you know, on this side of the picture is the healthy gut. Healthy gut. This side is the abnormal gut. So in the healthy gut, you eat the fiber. It goes to the good bacteria. They're good bacteria. You see, they got a smiley face on them right here, and they convert that fiber into SCFA, short chain fatty acids: two carbon acetate, three carbon propionate, most importantly, four carbon butyrate. The butyrate goes into the intestinal lining cells. The gut's called the enteric tract, so they're called enterocytes. C-Y-T-E, site means cell. So enteric tract cell, enterocytes. And it's a single layer thick. Okay, The lining of a structure with a lumen is called the epithelium. So you sometimes hear them called gut epithelial cells. It's all the same thing. Okay, The gut lining, the gut epithelium, the enterocytes, it's all the same thing. All right, so they take the butyrate and they use that to make tight junctions. I got TJ here for tight junctions. And the tight junctions are a solid connection, like a wrestler's grip, between the adjacent cells. So nothing can get through. None shall pass. And that's what you want. Okay. Um, and that means that the enterocytes, they're very good at processing the food stuff in the intestinal tract and they take in what they're supposed to. Normally you should only take in single amino acid at a time, two amino acids or three of them. So this would be a dipeptide with two amino acids, a tripeptide with three amino acids. But here's what happens when you have leaky gut. This arrow is pointing now to abnormal gut. These things here are all things that will cause leaky gut. Leaky gut happens when you damage the good bacteria so they're no longer available to make short chain fatty acids. It also happens when you don't eat fiber so they don't have any fiber they don't have any fiber to convert into the butyrate. Um, you can kill off the good bacteria by taking antibiotics. You also tend to wipe them out if you don't eat the fiber. Um, dietary oils can be toxic to them. Uh, meat has no fiber in it. So when a person eats a diet high in sat, fat, meat, and dairy, they're not getting any fiber. So those will tend to deplete the good bacteria. And then the bad bacteria will start to proliferate. The bad bacteria have no respect for our gut lining. The good bacteria are symbiotic with us, meaning that they've, so to speak, co-evolved with us in a sense. What I mean by that is humans and good bacteria have been together for many thousands of years, however many it is. We don't know the exact amount. But for them, you know, living in our colon, it's a good apartment. It's a good deal. They want us to be healthy. The longer we're healthy and alive, the longer they've got a nice apartment, okay? Whereas the bad bacteria, they don't give an SHIT about you, okay? They're just there, going to take advantage of the situation. 
Um, and so they'll eat through your mucus. The mucus lining secreted by the enterocytes helps protect them. They'll eat right through it. When you don't have tight junctions, you know, keeping these cells together like a wrestler's grip, the bacteria can get right through the lining and get inside our bodies. This is our bodily tissue. We got a lot of immune cells there in the lamina propria. That's the layer of tissue right below the enterocytes. And this will generate a big immune response and that can cause irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea, pain, bloating. It can cause um, Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease. It can cause ulcerative colitis. Okay, the bacteria will release an endotoxin called LPS, lipopolysaccharide. The lipopolysaccharide will then also elicit an immune reaction. It can get into the blood and it's called an endotoxin. So you'll hear this phrase, prandial means to eat. So postprandial means after eating. Um, endotoxin, when it's in the blood, it's emia, endotoxemia. So you'll hear this expression, after eating a processed food and meat diet, there's increased postprandial endotoxemia, meaning more endotoxin gets into the blood. And that's very prothrombotic. So it makes the blood more hypercoagulable, more tending to clot, plus the fat sticking the red blood cells together. So you can see how this is all going in a bad direction. You got fat sticking the blood cells together, there's salt constricting the vessels, and on top of it there's LPS promoting blood clots. You've now got you know three things promoting blood clots. Most people die from blood clots. All that stuff about bleeding to death, that's mostly in the movies. In real life, they die from blood clots. A blood clot in the arteries of the heart, that's a heart attack. Blood clot in the arteries of the brain, that's a stroke. Okay. Blood clots plugging up the arteries of Johnson, that causes impotence. So you don't want that. Okay, so how do you prevent all this? Eat your fiber and avoid the bad stuff, okay? And there's a lot of stuff that causes leaky gut. Um, psychological stress, I think it makes the gut ischemic, meaning that it diverts blood flow uh, towards the muscles and away from the gut. And that, when it's a chronic thing, can lead to uh, diminishment of uh, blood supply to the, the gut and it can cause it to fail and become leaky gut, emulsifiers and processed food. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. A lot of these additives to processed food uh, are associated with increased risk of leaky gut. You know, the GMO corn, BT corn, Bacillus thuringiens corn, carrageenan, polysorbate. Look at this, high fructose corn syrup. A lot of these things that are common, a lot of medications can do this, like NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Not good, because I'll tell you also something. Things that cause leaky gut increase the risk of leaky blood-brain barrier. So a lot of people say, oh, I can't concentrate. I got brain fog. I'm just not motivated. I'm like, well, you know, fix your diet, fix your gut, and you know, you might be surprised at how your cognitive function improves. Because um, I see these little teenagers, you know, 20-somethings, and they're, they're having concentration problems, motivation problems, psychological focus problems. You know, I'm 60. I can easily concentrate 12 hours in a row and just crank out book chapters in a day, and then people say, oh, you're so smart. I never took an honors class in high school, okay? I've gotten healthier since I, you know, became a vegetarian in my 30s, and then i become a vegan now. I've been 100% vegan for, gosh, I think it's about six years now. Um, let's see, what else? Bigger protein chunks can be absorbed across the intestinal lining. So again, normally you only have three or less, you know, a tripeptide or less of amino acids from a protein because it gets broken up by the digestive enzymes. When you get these bigger chunks in, you can get a big long sequence of amino acids because it's coming from an animal, if you're eating a lot of meat in the diet, that animal protein will have an amino acid sequence. A protein is like a, like think of it as being a necklace of different color uh, beads. Um, it'll be similar enough, it'll be different enough from our body that the immune system will attack it and form antibodies to it. But it'll be similar enough to our own body that some of those, um, those antibodies can get into the blood and they can cross-react with our own body. So to be like our own proteins is called molecular mimicry. And then to form antibodies that attack our self, that's called autoantibodies. And because the molecular mimicry leads to cross-reaction of the antibodies from not just the pathogen, the invading uh, protein, but also to our own tissues, that's called molecular, molecular mimicry with autoantibody cross-reactivity to our own uh, cells. And that's the main mechanism of autoimmune disease. And so all these, you know, terrible diseases, things like lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, that's the main mechanism of that stuff. And that's largely preventable. I mean, you could do all, you could just avoid these things. It's not, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do this. You can figure this out pretty easy. Avoid this stuff. Dramatically improve your risk. I mean, why not? And that's what I meant too, all those diseases. They're all related. That's why a person with one autoimmune disease tends to have a bunch of them. Bunch of them. Okay, so that concludes this chapter on the Western abdomen. Okay, hope that was interesting or helpful.